Greetings, maritime enthusiasts, friends and supporters of a reawakening of maritime consciousness in India. And even as we begin this day two of the first ever national workshop on Indian maritime history, I am really grieved to bring to you the sad news of the demise of a national naval legend, Rear Admiral Arun Audito, Ati Vishisht Seva Medal, Nausena Medal Gallantry, yesterday as he went on for his final voyage. Admiral Audito was an alumni of the 5th National Defence Academy course and later in was also part of the Indian Naval Submarine Arm, in fact the first batch and he did undergo training in UK and USSR. What he is more famous for and that's what makes him as a legend is he was the officer in charge of the uh, party that led the naval assault on Anjadeev Island during the 1961 Goa liberation. And it was a legendary uh, heroic action for which uh, he is forever part of our naval folklore and he has spoken to us at the Maritime History Society. Admiral Audito went on to become the first flag of the submarines uh, and he remained a great supporter of the Maritime History Society uh, as a member of the, the Navy Foundation. He would never miss a chance to come and attend to MHS events. We convey our heartfelt condolences to the family, to the friends and to the community. And we say this, that the nation salutes you for your contribution to the Indian effectiveness through all that you have served. And I pray and ask the entire audience, let's just pause for a minute to give a silent tribute to Admiral Audito. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Back to you, uh, Sri Ramesh, and to the team for the proceedings. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, it is good to remember all our heroes. Uh, definitely, we will also uh, pay our respects to him. Uh, Madam Padmashri, can you please take over? Yes, sir. Good morning, one and all. I have the pleasure of introducing uh, the speakers of uh, today's uh, session. Mr. Denard H. D'Souza has a master's in uh, ancient Indian culture history and archaeology from St. Xavier's College, Mumbai. His major area of interest is the study of ancient polities of the East and intermingling of cultures, religion, and art as a result of trans-regional movement. He also keenly observes current global trends and the application of history to augment policy. Currently, he works at the Maritime History Society as a research associate. And the second speaker is Janvi Loke Gawker, is a research associate at the Maritime History Society, Mumbai. She holds two undergraduate degrees in English literature and history and has completed Masters of Arts in History from the University of Mumbai. Our areas of interest are maritime history, military history, modern and contemporary Indian history. Her avid interest in maritime studies leads to her association with MHS. Over to you. Thank you, Dr. Padmasri, for that lovely introduction. A very good morning, students, faculty members of IMU, and my dear colleagues. I, Denard D'Souza, Research Associate at the Maritime History Society, 
and my colleague Janvi Loke Gaonkar will be sharing with you a story of India's 5,000 years of maritime development through history. The monsoon plays a very important role in this story, and I will start the session with this important aspect. So, what is a monsoon? The term monsoon is derived from the Arabic word mosim, which means a season. This was adapted to the English lexicon to mean the particular climatic condition that occurred in the summer months of the Northern Hemisphere. Usually, the climatic profile of the Arabian Peninsula tends to be sub-Saharan all throughout the year. So the monsoon is a good break from the monotony, and therefore the general term mosim came to be associated with the monsoons. The monsoons are a reversal of winds. Winds we know travel from a high pressure zone to a low pressure zone, just like how iron filings are pulled towards a magnet. This feature gives rise to a phenomenon called the intertropical convergence zone. Uh, in these slides, uh, uh, if you in this slide, if you notice in this picture, there are actually two ribbons you see that pass through the globe. The one on the top of the equator, which you see is the, is the summer ITCZ, and the one which you see down is the winter ITCZ. And if you see the variance between the two uh, in the Indian Ocean region, it, it is the largest uh, in comparison to the difference between the two, uh, between the two ITCZs all throughout the globe. So how does how does the ITCZ form? Uh, so generally what happens is during the summer months in the Northern Hemisphere, the Tropic of Cancer is the closest to the sun and therefore it starts heating, causing a low pressure zone. The same thing happens in the Southern Hemisphere when the Earth tilts. The Tropic of Capricorn gets closer to the Earth then. It is this ITCZ that causes the monsoons cool winds carrying moisture from the sea and it blows towards the Gangetic Plains. Now, if you see the uh, in the summer months, the ITCZ comes over the Indo-Gangetic Plain. What happens here is that the Tibetan Plateau and the Indo-Gangetic Plain actually becomes very warm. And the, this sudden warmness that gets created, it creates a low pressure zone out here. And when this low pressure zone gets created, it's natural that the high pressure uh, zone, which is formed in the Indian Ocean region, creates this winds. And these winds carry uh, cold and moist winds towards the land, towards the subcontinent. And these winds, instead of passing through the Himalayas, actually crash on the Himalayan, Himalayan mountains and it allows the precipitation on the subcontinent to happen. Now, if you see on the right side picture, this is during this is the ITCZ when it ships during the winter season. And uh, during the winter season, what happens is the seas start becoming warmer and the land which is there is becomes cooler. What happens then is that a low pressure zone forms into the uh, Indian Ocean and the cold, uh, the cold wet winds from the land start moving in the direction of the ITCZ, which is in the Indian Ocean region. Now, the monsoons that happen that follow this cycle uh, only occurs in the coastal states of Tamil Nadu and Andhra Pradesh. This is a very, uh, uh, a, a very regional phenomenon. So you do not get uh, monsoons all throughout the Indian subcontinent. It's just confined to a few regions. And these monsoons are used by sailors to navigate all throughout the season. So how is the monsoon relevant to maritime? Since ancient times, seafarers used these winds to sail across the ocean. In the Indian subcontinent, the Harappans were the earliest in recorded history to have sailed using winds. How do we know this? Because we have seals that depict barges with sails. The Harappans established mercantile relationships with the Mesopotamians and the Arabian Peninsula. In Mesopotamia, some of the Harappans built enclaves. The classical case is that of Guaba. It was a Harappan transregional settlement in southern Sumeria. These were probably mercantile townships of some sort. So one question that comes to mind is what were the Harappans trading? 
From Mesopotamian cuneiform seals, we know that Harappans were trading livestock, precious stones like agates, carnelian beads, lapis lazuli. They also traded in cloth and wood. We get a very peculiar reference from one such cuneiform tablet called the Cursing of a Gade. In this tablet, we are told that animals like elephant, water buffaloes, peacocks, and monkeys were imported to, to Mesopotamia. Imagine how intensive this trade would have been. A cuneiform tablet which records the building of the temple for Ningirsu tells us that King Gudia of Lagash imported wood from Maloha. Look at the plan on the picture to your right. This is pretty massive, you see. The temple looks so massive. It is obvious that really large logs of wood would have been transported. Wood like ebony and teak would have been favored because of their quality, sheen and durability. So what would the boats have looked like? The general consensus is that the vessels were made out of reed. These reed boats often plied in riverine terrains. They were also used for oceanic navigation. But one may ask, aren't these boats flimsy and susceptible to oceanic gales? There are chances that even wooden boats were used because the contemporary Mesopotamians also had wooden craft. Interestingly, there is a cuneiform tablet called the Lamentations of Suma and Ur from Guaba in southern Sumeria. It says large boats were transporting precious metals and gemstones. More research needs to be done to study the presence of wooden boats in Harappan region. Also, the kind of merchandise that were traded by the Harappans would have needed large and sturdy vessels. You see, this vessel out here was actually a replica, a cre uh, 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 a kind of a replica that was created by Thor Heyerdahl. He kind of um, you used the Harappan seals to create this boat and it was made totally of reed. And uh, when he plied this between, um, between uh, what is currently called as Iraq and India, these boats were actually very versatile and they kind of grasped the wind and were very smooth in transit. So they did not face, uh, they, it shows that the reed boats were one of the uh, eligible candidates to have uh, floated across the Indian Ocean region. So the Harappans directly actually traded with the Mesopotamians before the time of Limrizim. At this period, however, they started to dock at Dilmun and later on goods were consigned to Mesopotamia. So this is the trade route which the Harappans generally adopted while traveling to the Mesopotamian region. Initially, in the early heydays of the Harappan trade, the Harappan sailors would directly go to, uh, would go to uh, Suma. And while at the later dates, when, you know, during the uh, post-urbanization period, some form of um, uh, the trade, uh, di the direct trade with uh, Iraq actually had completely stopped or with Mesopotamia completely stopped. So what they would do was that they would, instead of directly trading with um, uh, with uh, Mesopotamia, they would stop, make a pit stop at Magan. Here there were probably colonies of the Harappans where they would uh, lay their goods and the, Maga, uh, the, uh, the, the people of Magan would carry these goods later on to the, uh, uh, to the uh, Mesopotamian heartland. So uh, this was the route that was generally charted at this time period. So now we come to the high water mark of the Indian maritime legacy. In this period, uh, just give me a second, please. In this period, the Indo-Roman trade was at the center of the Indian Ocean economy. The Romans were very fond of black pepper, which they used for flavoring their sauces and meats. It was also used by Roman apothecaries to make medications for ailments and diseases. Many of these medicinal recipes required the infusion of pepper. The pepper corns were worth its price in gold. The author of the Periplus of the Eritrean Sea, a treatise on the navigation, laments that the economic imbalance caused by pepper trade, which drained the Roman economy of its gold. 
uh, for long, the colonial historiographers believed that the Romans invented the maritime route of India. The colonial historians had a bias. They considered that all utilities of human betterment were invented by the Europeans. So the only Europeans that came in contact with the Indians to the sea were the Romans, and they assumed it with alacrity that they were the only ones to have invented the maritime route. However, we know from a Greek navigator named Eudoxus of Cyzius's account that it was an Indian who leaked the secret maritime route of the northern Indian Ocean region. So after the Western Front, we are led to the Eastern Seaboard. Uh, the Jataka stories generally tell us that, uh, you know, the Eastern Seaboard was also a very active maritime trade zone uh, from the earliest time. Uh, we see a lot of Roman coins and amphoras as far as the coast of Bengal. Uh, there were port towns on the eastern seaboard like those of Tamralipti, Palur, and the Kaveri Pumpatanam, which in many ways were an active trading hub. These port towns connected the markets of the hinterlands to the transoceanic maritime centers. Uh, the Emperor Ashoka sent his daughter Theri Sangamitra to Tamraparani from Tamralipti, that is in Bengal. Uh, and Tamra Parani is in Sri Lanka. Most importantly, the Kalingans were also navigating at this point in time. Uh, next, we come to the communities that were engaged in seafarings. Uh, now, we have three communities. I have placed them according to their termination period of the activities. It is possible that all of these communities were contemporaries of each other. Uh, these communities are the Sindhabas of ancient Kalinga, Malams of Kutch and Gujarat, Kolis of the Konkan. The Kalingan Sindhabas were masters of the Eastern Sea. They were merchant sailors and were trading with Southeast Asia since early centuries of the Common Era. They traded with the islands of Java and Bali, where the memory of these sailors is still rem is remembered in the term Kaling. The voyage from Odisha started in the month of Karthik on a Purnami day. This was the start of the retreating monsoons or the winter monsoons. Even today, this historical event is celebrated as Khudarakuni Osha or Boitabundana or Bali Jatra in the modern state of Orissa. Replicas of these boats are set afloat in lakes, ponds and seas and other water bodies in remembrance of these sailors. A parallel festival called as Loi Krothong is celebrated in Thailand, where palm baskets are set afloat in waters. Next, we have the Malams. The Malams are a native seafaring community of Kutch and Gujarat region who were engaged in transoceanic navigation. Most of their activities was connected on the, uh, was concentrated on the eastern coast of Africa and the Gulf Peninsula. They were also master navigators who maintained sailing manuals called the Pothis. These manuals were a sailor's digest to navigation in the Indian Ocean region, often giving description of the topographic, climatic condition and wind directions, among many other things. The Malams, besides being navigators, were also expert sea, uh, shipbuilders. They would, they would build sturdy ships which were built on indigenous plans. These ships were widely used until the advent of modernity. So in short, the Malams, Malams stopped sailing when new technologies of sailing came, became the norm, especially the invention of steamships was one of the primary reasons for the Malams to be out of trade. The last community that I would be talking about uh, is the Kolis. The Kolis were an ancient tribe who were intrinsically connected with maritime activities. Like coastal fishing, craft building, etc. The Kolis were not involved in transoceanic navigation, rather they were masters of the coastal terrain, which found favor for, their, uh, for the Maratha rulers who used them for coast guarding and defensive apparatus against the colonial powers. So what is the status of the Kolis today? Unlike the Malams, the Kolis did not dis get displaced plainly because they adapted modern fishing techniques to their traditional practices. A classic example is that they started using fiberglass boats in place of indigenous hodis which were made from wood. 
The Kohli's still dominate the fishing trade in Maharashtra and often observed from sailing during the advancing southwest monsoons, a time when the seas are the roughest. So now uh, we shall see the difference between the Western vessels and the Indian vessels since the ancient up till the early modern period. I have two pictures here. One is that of the uh, Roman galley and the other one is the Indian courtier. Uh, the, these, uh, I've just used them as representation, but the, mostly the techniques of building ships in the, uh, in the good old days uh, continued to be on the similar lines and patterns. So the Roman galleys, which were generally, uh, they were made from oak or some kind of Mediterranean wood. Uh, while the Indian uh, kotiyas or the Indian uh, navas were actually built from hardwoods like the Malabar teak. So what uh, the difference between these two woods that the oak was a less, uh, a less sturdy wood. It was prone to uh, getting decayed in the wa warm waters of the Indian Ocean, while the Malabar teak actually lasted a long period of time. Uh, the other differentiating factor between these two boats is that the Roman vessels or the Western vessels which were there were actually nailed together, whereas the Indian vessels were actually sewn together. So they actually were sewn with some kind of fiber. In this, mostly in the Indian case, it was coconut fiber that was used to sew this boat. Uh, the uh, Western boats were actually very fragile and they were uh, actually rigid in some sense, and they could, when while the voyages in the Indian Ocean region where the gales tend to be very strong, the currents were extremely strong, they actually gave way. Uh, on the Indian, uh, the, uh, on the other hand, the Indian vessels were actually far more agile because they were soon together, not uh, nailed together. So this allowed them some amount of flexibility to these strong currents. So now we come to the wood actually that changed uh, that changed the urbanization patterns from the hinterland to the seafront. This is the classic teak or the Malabar teak. It was a long held belief among the English that the oak was the best wood to build ships. This, this long held belief was shattered when the Brits encountered the Malabar teak. English ships were now being built in India. The British had their headquarters in Surat, where they managed to build a slip to build and repair ships. Slowly, they got ownership of the Bombay Islands. They saw a potential for a maritime ecosystem. My colleague Janvi will be talking on this further in uh, further down in this uh, in this uh, segment of uh, our presentation. Uh, we are told that the warships made of Indian teaks actually saved the English from the threats of Napoleon. It was at this very era that Europe was under turmoil of the Napoleonic Wars and the oak reserves in Britain were running dry. The next best alternative was the Malabar teak. In conclusion, I would say India's maritime legacy owes greatly to its monsoons. It was the monsoons that fostered an ancient precursor to modern globalization, especially urbanization of the Western seafront, which will be elaborated by my colleague Janvi. Thank you. Uh, Jandi, over to you. Thank you, Danat. Good morning, everyone. I trust I'm audible. Let me begin by reinstating that maritime influence can be seen in all walks of Indian history. Our development is owed to the maritime economy and a gradual advancement of maritime infrastructure along the coastal frontiers. In this part of the session, we shall look at the skills connect, technology, economy, and related aspects that flourish through the maritime knowledge system. Speaking about Indian maritime history, I'm sure Lothal will be familiar to many of you. Any mention of Indian maritime history will be incomplete without the mention of Lothal. This is the missing link between the settlements in Harappa and Gujarat. The excavation and discovery of Lothal was a result of the need for exploring India's ancient past within the territory identified as India after the partition in 1947. As no traces of Harappan civilization are found to the north of Gujarat, it is understood that the people and goods did not move between the two places via overland routes. They must have traveled via the seacoast. The presence of a dock in Lothal confirms this. 
Today, it stands as a testimony to the maritime prowess of the Indians. Arikamedu in the Coromandel coast has been a hub of ancient maritime trade and activities. This archaeological site is located around five kilometers from Pondicherry. The excavation and findings say that Arikamedu was a major trading center. It was engaged in trade and of many items that include export of textile, semi-precious gems, beads, and shell bangles. Wine is believed to have been one of the most imported goods. Tamil Sangam literature of a few centuries before and after Common Era, especially the uh, Shilapati Karam and Bani Mikhalai, testifies to the great overseas trade of the ancient mariners. The Roman trade with India was a very intensive maritime venture. Maritime trade was regulated by merchant guilds that played a crucial role. The port city of Muziris in present-day Kerala had been a major center of trade with the Roman Empire. Malabar was a confluence of the East and the West as it was a hub for traders as it flourished. This was just a background of the historical importance of ports in ancient maritime trade. Ports, docks, seaworthy ships form an important aspect of maritime infrastructure. And now we shall look at how this has shaped India's maritime economy. India has always been one of the major hubs of maritime activities. Changing political dynamics had a great impact on the coast and in the making of this maritime nation. For many Indian rulers of different princely states and kingdoms, Delhi was synonymous as the ultimate seat of power. This hotbed of power politics that was once contested for by many ironically was the only reason that weakened their guard against the European colonizers. The coming of the Europeans in India has an undeniable maritime connect. Be it the Portuguese, the French or the English, their quest to harness the potential of the coastal boundaries of India, in addition to annexation of land and kingdoms of the hinterland, in order to establish their supremacy as a lesson, conveys that their visions and plans were shrouded by diplomacy in politics and control. When the Europeans came to India, their intentions were limited to trade. It was only later on that they started to colonize in order to increase their trade profits and their sphere of influence. The English East India Company was a private enterprise, a joint stock company supported by the crown. Hence, we see a gradual hegemony asserted by the English East India Company in their venture as they were not under direct control of the crown and gradually escalated their imperial advances pan India. Surat had been a major commercial port and an important center of trade during the medieval period. But due to an increase in the silting of the port, the British who had established themselves as an important colonial power shifted their commercial capital to Bombay as it was a natural harbor. Under the British rule of both the company and the crown, the city of Bombay was developed further. Initially, while planning the city, they considered its physical features and other attributes that gave it an edge. It was the far-sightedness of the British who analyzed the importance of the geography of Bombay and developed it as Herb's Prima in Indus, the premier city of the empire. The foundation of a modern metropolis on the west, western coast of India was laid by Gerald Angier a good four centuries ago. In his short span of, in his short tenure spanning from 1669 to 1677, he managed to transform a sleepy fishing hamlet into a bustling port town, throbbing with activity. Sea routes dominated majority of the trade between India and Britain. While the English prospered leaps and bounds, the maritime trade and other activities also brought in money and profits for some of the wealthy trading classes amongst the Indian community. What would have Bombay been without a well-endowed port? Thus was the beginning of a modern metropolis of what Bombay is as we see it today. Thus it becomes a matter of urgency to analyze and assess 
the role of maritime trade and activity that has contributed to the making of the city of Bombay and of the nation. Having seen the transition of Bombay in the historical context, we shall look at the heritage facility of the dockyard, which has made substantial contribution to the built heritage of Bombay. In this, the contribution, the, the contribution of the Wadia family towards developing our built heritage and maritime infrastructure with respect to ships, docks, and ports is truly immense. It was Lauji Nusarvanji Wadia, the patriarch and founder of the Wadia shipbuilding dynasty, who in 1736 obtained a contract from the British East India Company for building docks and ships in Bombay. The Wadia family went on to build ships of the line and they were regarded as the master builders. By now, Bombay was made as the port of call. The city was making steady progress and adapting to changing times. The Bombay dockyard was set up in 1735. The yard's facilities were developed to keep pace with the shipbuilding requirements, which included construction of dry docks, namely Bombay Dry Dock, which was the first dry dock built in Asia, followed by the Duncan Dry Dock between 1808 to 1810. And most of these facilities are still in use. Post-independence, the Bombay Dockyard was renamed as the Naval Dockyard. Today, it is operational under the Western Naval Command of the Indian Navy. In this portrait, Yamseji Bamanji Wadia holds a plan of HMS Minden that was launched in 1810. This was the first ship of the line to be built for the Royal Navy out of England. As my colleague had pointed out earlier in the session, the Royal Navy recognized that ships could be built more cheaply in Bombay and the teak, the local timber, was more durable than the English oak. But at this juncture, it is important to note that this is one of the earliest times when ships were constructed in Bombay using blueprints and plants that were thoroughly drafted on paper as opposed to the oral tradition of dissemination of knowledge of the boat building tradition. These are some of the famous Wadia ships that ascertains its legacy. HMS Minden, it was on her deck that Francis Scott Key penned a few verses of the American national anthem, the Star Spangled Banner. HMS Cornwallis, this was a 74 gun third rate ship of the line built in the Bombay dockyard. After China's defeat in the first opium war at the hands of the English, the famous Treaty of Nanking was signed aboard her. HMS Asia, it was an 84-gun 84, 84 second-rate ship, ship of the line for, built for the Royal Navy. It participated in the Battle of Navarino in the Greek War of Independence. It was the large, last major naval battle in history to be fought entirely with sailing ships. HMS Trincomalee was launched in 1817, and this is still afloat as a museum ship in Hartlepool, United Kingdom. In the wake of industrialization in England, the realms of production underwent a metamorphosis. Technology took over, and it has only developed. Ironically, this phase also marked the deindustrialization in the Indian subcontinent as we were reduced to a colony which was to facilitate and furnish the English industries with raw material and other resources. Clearly, the Indian shipbuilding industry wasn't immune to such a drastic change. There were wide repercussions. The glory of the master builders eventually faded. The sturdy steel ships that were once sought after were now replaced by steamships built in England due to advanced technology. India missed out on the Industrial Revolution that had a larger impact on the shipbuilding industry and the indigenous ship designing culture. But Bombay and its shipbuilders were resilient. They developed expertise in ship repairs and refits. The boilers, sea tubes and valves were made in the cast iron foundry in the dockyard back then, which is still functional even today. 
the dry docking facilities that were made available helped the indian shipbuilding industry to flourish most of the trade and economy that happened then and what happens today is due to the booming shipping industry hence it wouldn't be wrong to say that the city of bombay is a by product of maritime economy the need for better docking and ba- banking facilities at such a phase is self explanatory the undertaking of construction of new docks and related facilities was deemed necessary and beneficial in order to improve the efficiency of the maritime trade and commerce the sassoon dock was set up in 1875 by albert david sassoon which was the first private wet dock in entrepreneurship this led to the setting up of an important body in bombay this was the bombay port trust the need to form a governing body to administer the affairs of the bombay port was felt necessary this was due to an increase in trading activities in addition to the growth of monopoly acquired by the private companies of the landing and shipping facilities of the port the port trust act of 1873 provided for the creation of a corporation under the name and style of trustees of the port of bombay with the spawning of other docks like alexandra victoria princess dock the magra facility also saw a gradual rise in the steamship industry when the british india steam navigation company rented its facility today we see state of the art ship craft being indigenously built at the magra dock and with this we draw closer to the conclusion of this presentation the role and contribution of the maritime sector in developing the city to what it is today must be acknowledged the mushrooming of allied industries is a subsequent factor here i have an interesting take for all of us to visualize the growth of allied industries the slides that you now see is a mosaic of industrial advertisements from newspapers between late 1870s to 1920s spawning of associated industries and other mercantile interests is clearly seen between this period many capitalist undertaking can be seen advertisements affirm the existence of industries and ventures in casting rope making shipping lines nuts and bolts industries and shops ice factories fish and net providers paints and varnish making industries uniform maker that align with the needs of the shipping industry the economy of bombay strengthened which led to the creation of an industrial infrastructure this was the rise of a modern scd a special economic zone which is a precursor to the modern metropolis that bombay has become today if we are to learn from our history the biggest lesson is that the indian terrestrial approach lured us away from the seas which were left almost unprotected the failure amongst the indians to perceive this potential threat from the maritime frontiers and percolate a maritime vision and policies amongst the masses was one of the great problems that led to the rise of colonial rule in india due to our terrestrial approach and mindset we have forgotten to acknowledge the importance of sea It's about time that we analyze our history from a maritime perspective. For now, I leave you with this image of how the built heritage and maritime affairs intermingle with the economic matters, thus creating a history and building a stronger future of our nation. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Denard and Janvi, for this wonderful overview on. the uh, maritime history and especially the history of uh, bombay docks then there the uh, dockyard uh, the wadia builders sasun dock so on and so forth um the questions uh, there are many questions maybe there is one question posed by mr santosh kumar He says uh, Can you please throw some light on the expeditions of Cholas? Uh, uh, and the Southeastern Asia. Yes. 
Uh, and uh, there is another question by Mr. Muthukumaran about a similar question, the trade between Pandyas and the Romans. Yeah. So the uh, Chola navigation, actually, so it's actually a very uh, interesting uh, uh, piece. And I've written a paper also on the Chola navigation. What actually, uh, the Chola uh, expedition, to what exactly uh, inspired them to take on this kind of a maritime raid that they took? So uh, what I had said in my paper was that it was not merely a territorial conquest. Rather, it was something that was intended to uh, maintain a maritime hegemony over the uh, mar maritime trading lanes that passed through the Malacca Strait. Uh, what happened at that point in time was that um, Sri Vijaya, which was the dominant kingdom in the uh, Malay Peninsula, was actually, uh, with the help of some of the local communities out there, created a maritime empire and with this, what they did was they actually kept a check on every moving uh, vessel within that within their territory, and the territory that they actually controlled through was were the uh, were the uh, were lanes which uh, led to China. Uh, but in what later on happened was that there was a lot of harassment that was going on, and uh, traders were actually uh, uh, you know caught, uh, they were actually impounded and they were collecting large amounts of taxes. Uh, so uh, it is, they say, one of this reason that uh, uh, the Chola uh, emperor, Rajendra Chola, uh, was, uh, uh, you know, he, he was mob mobilized to kind of conquer Sri Vijaya. So that was the, the uh, one of the reasons. Another reason that we come to know from the Chinese chroniclers is that uh, the uh, Sri Vijayans uh, actually passed on wrong information to the uh, Chinese court, uh, in the Chinese court. What happened, what they would say was that the Cholas were actually a, uh, a kingdom which was, un which was a subordinate to some other kingdom. So they say that the, this kind of information uh, was very offensive to the uh, Chola king because he considered, and he was actually a Sarvabhauma in that sense. So he found it very difficult to palate and you know he in order to take his revenge uh against the Srivijayans he conquered Srivijaya, Kadaram and the nearby areas right, which is uh, even including parts of Thailand and uh, Burma and even the islands of uh, the Andamans and Nicobar but however the first uh, analysis that he it was because of the trade uh, uh the trade blockade that was imposed by the Srivijayans the the Chola king decided that he had to conquer this region and establish his supremacy or uh, hegemony on the maritime trade. What was the other question, if you could repeat? Yeah, uh, the other question is, uh, it's very interesting. Uh, uh, do we have any trade between the Pandyas and the Romans? Yes, yes, you do have. Uh, how did uh, that happen? Because we all... Fact, you were all like talking CEO. about you know Gujarat and uh, Mesopotamia and all that. Yeah. But is there any connection between the eastern part of India to the west? Yes. Yes. I said even Bengal, that is Tamralipti, uh, that uh, it's called as Tamluk now. You actually found uh, amphorays, Roman amphorays, and coins out there. So there was an active maritime presence. Also, if you look at the early Sangam literature, which is uh, you know uh, the Pat, uh, I forgot the Patina Pillai. In one of it is, uh, you, you find references of Roman sailors coming on the coast of Kaveri Pompatinam. They are called as Yavanas. Uh, so also the Pandian kings actually had uh, what is called as the Roman guard. Uh, he, they had Roman guards to guard their palaces and uh, harems and so on and so forth. So we you know, and they were very fond of Roman wine. Uh, I, even uh, uh, in Arika Medu, for example, besides just having the large hoard of uh, coins, you also have amphorays present out there. So you, there was there was some sort of uh, what you say there was already a, a bustling trade happening between the Pandyas and the uh, Romans. Uh, another thing is that the uh, the western coast, especially the Kerala coast. To, which is the Makotai region, uh, Kodungunalur, uh, 
uh, the uh, the uh, cheras actually were situated not in the kerala heartland but rather in the tamil uh, highlands especially in the coimbatore region which is they had the capital based out from there called as karur so that form the once the roman merchant gurnalur probably it was transported by land on to the uh, palagad pass all the way into the uh, tamil heartland so that connection also exists just um, the roman connection also exists in that sense hope this answers your question both these questions yeah thank you uh, niranjan uh, you have some uh, questions on your youtube channel can you please uh, shoot them sure sir uh, so uh, there are a couple of questions uh, the first question is quite uh, broad based and uh, it, uh, the question uh, the, uh, the the question is what are a few takeaways from indian maritime history in terms of infrastructure that will guide our future maritime development uh, this is the first question and uh, the second question uh, sir which were native coastal communities from konkan in trading and seafaring koli is one in seafaring were there even other involved and is there any reference to the same thank you i think i'll let ranvi an- answer the first question i'll go for the second one yes uh, thank you for the question um about the infrastructure part of it um if uh, if we look at what happened at the suez canal just uh, recently